Coming up with a valid trading signal and then building some sort of system capable of algorithmically executing trades based on that signal value are only a few pieces of the puzzle. How much of your capital should you risk on any one trade within that system? In this video, we're gonna look at the Kelly Criterion as a solution to this problem. As always, this Jupyter Notebook will be available in the description below. I will also post it to the Quant Guild Library on GitHub where you can find all of my Jupyter Notebooks and associated YouTube videos. At the top of this notebook, you'll notice some related Quant Guild videos that will give you some more background and context for this topic. Moreover, if you're interested in mastering your quantitative skills, or would like to take live classes with myself, check out quantguild.com. Let's begin by discussing this idea of the expected value of a trading system. If I have a trading system, let's call it capital T here, then what I'm suggesting is whether it's a sentiment signal or a momentum signal, every trade is governed by that system. So every trade, I'm gonna call that tau, this little t, is a part of this trading system. Now each trade is defined in a way that we have a net zero position on exit. So we're gonna generate some sort of P and L. So each trade that we make in this system, capital T, is going to produce a profit or a loss. Now this profit or loss itself is a random variable, but once we accumulate enough information empirically by trading with this system or back testing it, we can produce the expected value of this trading system. I've decomposed the expected value of this trading system into a few different components, and this is the math notation for it, but I've also written it in plain English here. So for each trade, the expected P&L or profit and loss is broken up into the average winning trade value times the probability of winning a trade, plus the average losing trade value times the probability of losing a trade. And this is given by the law of total expectation. But what are the implications in our wealth over a certain number of trades? Well, what I have here is I have a distribution, which is our P&L, and I have our wealth paths. If our expected value of the system is positive, then we're going to be able to accumulate wealth over time. If the expected value of the system was negative, then we would be losing wealth over time. It's very important to make the distinction that every single time we make a trade, we're drawing from this distribution. So if the trade was a winner, then we're gonna draw from this density of wins to determine how much money we made on that trade. If the trade was a loser, we're gonna draw from this loss distribution. And if the overall expected value is positive, then we'll accumulate that wealth over time as seen in these two charts. There are a couple of really important things we need to consider in each of these cases here. The first is we're making bets of fixed size. So this chart on the left is considered a small wager. After a thousand trades, we only accumulate up to what looks like roughly 20,000 on the potential upside. Whereas when we do the large bet, we can accumulate looks like up to 60,000 on the upside. Of course, you don't get something for nothing. So when we increase the amount that we are betting on this right chart here, we're also increasing the probability that we go bankrupt before we accumulate that wealth. Very important ideas. Moreover, we're only actually going to experience one of these sample paths. We can't choose which one we're gonna be on. It's based on luck. So it's possible that I'm very lucky in this large bet case and I climb all the way up to roughly 60,000 in wealth. It's also equally possible that I end up losing all my money before I get to accumulate that wealth. Now on the other chart here where we make smaller bets, that probability of going bankrupt is less than the probability of going bankrupt on the large bet case, but of course we don't have the same potential upside. So how much capital should we risk on each trade? Should we use a small fixed bet or a large fixed bet? Well, there are a couple of really big problems with this analysis before we even talk about bet sizing. The first is that we're estimating all of these quantities from data, and surely they're going to change over time, but we're gonna talk about that in a moment. The bigger issue here is we're assuming that the amount of capital that we are risking on each trade is fixed, and this certainly is not the case. Think of it this way. If you had a million dollars to trade with, wouldn't you want to risk more capital per trade than if you had a thousand dollars to trade with? You wouldn't want to trade in lots of $20 if you had a million dollars. You would want to trade in lots of maybe $20,000. That just makes sense, but that changes the entire dynamics of the system. Really what we're doing is we're starting to tease out whether or not this system and our wealth paths are what's called ergodic. And we could dive into the technicals, but I would rather focus 
on the impact in the example above. Fundamentally, I haven't changed the example above. I'm operating in the same trading system. I still have a positive expected value. The only difference is how I am betting in the system. So on the left, I have these fixed increments, these fixed amounts allocated to each trade, just as we saw above in the small bet and the large bet case. They're fixed bets. But in reality, right, we're gonna wanna bet relative to our bank roll. But what happens if we bet relative to our bank roll? Well, we get these funky wealth paths on the right. More formally, the time average is not equivalent to the ensemble average. More intuitively, a few paths in the case that we bet relative to our bankroll will accumulate extraordinary wealth and drag the overall average up. But keep in mind, we walk only one of these sample paths and a majority of these sample paths are below our initial capital or even very close to zero by the time we reach a thousand trades. Long story short, why does this matter? We're operating in this environment. We're not operating in this environment. So if we have positive expected value, we need to ensure that we're accumulating wealth over time and we're not being misled by statistics because a few sample paths here will accumulate extraordinary wealth. But remember, we're gonna end up walking one of these at random. And if you were to choose out of a hat which one we walked, we would end up walking one that actually lost money relative to how much we started with, even though there's positive expected value. Let's look at an example. So if I take the average wealth at the end of the thousand trades with this trading system in the environment where we're betting relative to our bank roll, my average wealth is 1,757. I started with a thousand bucks, so I made 757 on average. That's great. Let's trade with this system. Hold your horses. We got to hold our horses here because what is the probability of ending with more money than we started with? In other words, what is the probability that after we trade 1,000 times, we end up with more than $1,000 by the thousandth trade? The probability of ending above $1,000 after 1,000 trades is 47%, less than half less than half of these paths are actually going to end above our initial capital. This is how we're being misled by the overall expected value of our trading system. An intuitive way to understand why the path that we would experience relative to the overall expected value of the trading system differs so drastically is by the flaw of averages. There is a very classic picture of somebody standing in a few inches of water and then there's a massive drop off and a sign that says, you know, average depth seven feet. Even though the average is seven, it's not informative because there's one spot that drops off very, very, very deep and the rest of it is very shallow. That is essentially what we're observing here is most of these paths accumulate negative wealth but a few have extraordinary growth and that is what's accounting for the positive expected value in that sense. So what should we do? How should we bet? Well, our goal is to maximize our wealth specifically because we want to bet relative to our bank roll. We want to maximize the geometric mean of returns over the arithmetic mean. This goes back to what I had stated earlier. We want to bet relative to our bank roll. So we need to maximize this mathematical object in the expectation. Remember, we're dealing with randomness here. We're never gonna be able to choose which path we walk, but we are going to be able to try to maximize the overall average path based on our betting strategy, and that's the best that we can do. So what is the solution to this betting problem? Well, that would be this Kelly criterion. If you solve this maximization problem, that is the expected value of your wealth path at n plus one, then you will get this value for how much you should allocate to each trade, how much you should risk on each trade. This is optimal in that sense. Not sure how to solve this maximization problem? Check out quantguild.com. We got over 90 lessons in math, probability, and finance that will help you learn the necessary skills to tackle complicated problems like this one. After solving this maximization problem, the Kelly criterion itself is a function of 
the probability of winning a trade, the probability of losing a trade, the net profit per unit risked, and that together is going to give you the fraction of your bankroll that you should risk on each trade. Now keep in mind, we are estimating those quantities from data. Just like I had mentioned earlier, that's one of the big problems with this, but we're gonna to get to that in a moment. Let's talk about trading now with the Kelly Criterion. Remember, we're operating in this environment. We're not operating in this arithmetic environment. We're operating in this one. Let's see how the Kelly Criterion changes our betting strategy and the wealth paths that we would experience. Now, both of these charts are risking a proportion of our bankroll on each trade, but the Kelly Criterion is maximizing the expected value of that log growth rate of our wealth path. And if I had to choose a sample path at random to walk, which would I prefer? Would I prefer a fixed proportion of our bankroll and walk one of these at random? Or would I prefer to walk a Kelly Criterion path at random? Well, if you gave me the option, probabilistically, I would certainly prefer to walk a Kelly Criterion path. That is because it is optimal in the statistical sense. Let's look at some probabilities to reaffirm this. Remember above, when we looked at the probability of ending above our initial capital in the case where we have a fixed bank roll allocated to each trade, we only survived above our initial capital roughly 47% of the time, less than half. But in this case, if I walk a Kelly sample path, then 76% of the time, I'm going to walk a path that ends above the initial capital by the 1000th trade. This is substantial. This is significantly different than the instance where we have a fixed amount from our bank roll, a non-optimal fixed amount allocated to each trade from our bank roll. As you can see here, it substantially changes even the median final wealth. The median final wealth of the Kelly paths is 1018 versus the case where we just have some other non-optimal fixed amount, which is 836. So given a trading system where I want to scale with the amount of capital available, I am going to allocate risk to each trade according to the Kelly criterion. What are some challenges and limitations of this betting strategy? Well, a reasonable question is, do you really know the decomposed expected value of your system? Can you actually assess the probability of winning a trade and losing a trade? Probably not. No, you can estimate them from back tests and live tradings, but these are also stochastic processes. What I've done here is I've simulated these values. We have a probability of winning that is going to fluctuate over time along with the probability of losing. Same thing with the average trade sizes. We may win more in some cases when we win. We may lose more in some cases when we lose. And this is also going to oscillate randomly over time. I have a, a remark about how we should think about these quantities in different regimes likely you should estimate these quantities differently in different environments, volatile environments, different types of administrations and policy, inflation, interest rates, so on and so forth. Why should we care about this estimation error? Well, let's look at the exact same charts above our wealth path after a series of trades with an incorrect estimation for the Kelly criteria. Uh-oh. On the left here, we still have that nice Kelly criteria sample paths, right? I would want to walk one of these sample paths if I had to choose between these two charts. But on the right here, we're also observing a Kelly criterion path. This is an optimal bank role according to the Kelly criteria, but we're estimating the quantities incorrectly. And this is what we're going to face in real life. If you try to estimate these quantities, they are noisy. They are not going to converge to a static value. And likely what you're going to input into the Kelly criterion as a function for the amount of your bankroll that you should risk on each trade is going to be incorrect. And look, we're kind of right back to where we started. Our goal is this chart on the left, but with estimation error, we have this chart on the right. Some closing thoughts for you. Challenges in reality. Returns are not ergodic. There are a variety of reasons for this. 
estimating correct values for the inputs to the Kelly criterion is difficult. Even small estimation errors can yield massive discrepancies. Both of these are allocating risk to each trade based on the Kelly criterion. It's just the chart on the right is using estimated quantities, which surely will be incorrect. And look at the probability of ending above initial capital in the case where there's estimation error. If we estimate it accurately, it's 71%, that's great. If we estimate it inaccurately, that's 41%. That is not what we are going for. Some future topics I would like to cover, stochastic processes and topics in stochastic calculus. How do we estimate these quantities from data? What can we do to measure the uncertainty of our estimations? And I'd also like to talk about building more of like an adaptive trading bot, iteratively estimating this criterion as we update our estimates for parameters. If you'd like to see some of these topics, please leave a comment below, let me know. That's gonna do it for this video on how to trade with the Kelly Criterion. I hope you enjoyed, I hope you learned something. If you liked it and wanna see more like this video, please subscribe, like, leave a comment, let me know. If you wanna master your quantitative skills, check out quantkill.com. You can take live classes with myself. Other than that, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.